First things first, gentlemen, how are you? We are good. We are in Amsterdam. The sun is shining. I just woke up. I just had two of these Fritz Cola thingies. And I feel energized and vitalized and young and fresh and awesome. It's a good nap, I suppose. Good enough, yeah. All right. So before we get into the new album, I'd like to go back to the beginning a little bit. And now you all met, um, I believe, at music uh, college. The Academy of Music, yes. Do you remember meeting each other for the first time? So, for instance, do you remember what you what your first impression of Hannes was? Uh, well, <clears throat> we. Uh, we saw each other on and off in the hallways, and then I, uh, I think we played together for the first time about a year in or something. Where they kind of throw us all in a room together on Mondays, or whatever that was. And uh, I remember playing a song by uh, the band. Mm, uh, the Wait, right? The Wait. I was playing the drums and Hannes played the guitar. And uh, I thought Hannes was the most boring, uninspired person I have ever laid my eyes on. Like there was something about his persona that really bothered me. Uh, except when he started playing. When he started playing, there was a fury and fire of a thousand dragons. <laughs> <laughs> With swords <laughs> and fire. With his axe. <laughs> yeah, he lit a fire in my heart <laughs> and in my belly. And I thought uh, to myself, if I can somehow change this man's personality, <laughs> maybe we can start a band together. <laughs> that's the, that's a good start to any relationship. I'm gonna change if I it. can just change go this person, it's going to be great. <laughs> so how long did it take to change him? And I, uh, it's still a work, working it's a work on in it. progress. Like, but with Fritz Cola. <laughs> <laughs> Anything is possible. <laughs> no, but um, I think Hannes felt quite the same, but the opposite of me. I remember the first, I think that was actually actually the first time I noticed you at least. That was, you were running through the corridor of the school and that's a long freaking corridor, like vroom, and then jumping over this couch, jumping onto this other poor dude lying on the couch and he went like, Aah! and he was scared to death. It was great and I thought if I can only make this guy quiet down <laughs> just slightly i'm sure this is going to be great <laughs> kind of meet in the middle type yeah thing. <laughs> yeah we are pretty much the east and west of the band you could say in a way but we managed to find a lot of uh, common ground over the years yeah, yeah. How, how quickly did you realize that on a musical level you were uh, very compatible right away that's the thing uh, it was really really well composed right away musically but that's the only thing that kind of worked out in the beginning because we didn't know each other and we had very little in common uh, and we really like i remember really struggling like after we would finish a song in rehearsal like da, 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 yeah you know and bam song's over all right you know looking what, at each other what like do we do now um, and like uh, you know you guys want to go watch a game have a pizza i was like no don't like football ah. Okay, we'll see you next uh, time. Okay, next week then, same time? Yeah. Okay. You know, and it was like that for the better part of, well, six months or something, mm. maybe? Mm. Because of that, I find it interesting, because I, you posted a couple of videos about kind of uh, being a band for 10 years, uh, short documentary clips, and in that, uh, I can't remember who it's, uh, who says it, but th that you were quite diff different people, all four of you, but then you toured early on. And so what was that like, those, those that first tour, kind of getting to know each other, uh, but being in such close proximity for, for a long time. I mean, I guess that was the that was our getting to know each other, you know, because we didn't really find out because we didn't really hang when we were at home. So uh, the touring like forced us to be in on the same little bus and in the same room at the hotel and on the same, you know, it forced us to live together and really get to know each other, whether we like or not you know and i mean if you can get along staying on one of these buses for three months in a row i'm pretty sure you can you can manage whatever it's basically it like a marriage with four people in it uh and uh yeah and it's not like a happy marriage with any of them well it's not more, always not always you have to work you have to it's work exactly you have to work on it no yes but, no, but i feel uh, it's way more comfortable now that everybody kind of you know everybody found their place eventually like you do when you're a group of people and then i mean we've been a band for 10 years and sure. people have changed you know we we discovered new things hannes is way fresher now and i've i've calmed down a little bit and yeah. you know so um 
Sometimes I have to go like this, Adam, wake up, for fuck's sake, come on. I don't, I don't get a lot of that. <laughs> is, is there one thing that you remember from the first tour, so something that sticks out? Maybe a show or... I think one of the things that really unified us as like, we went outside of Sweden for the first time in, in or like for the first real proper tour in April of 2010. Um, no, that was late, sorry, the later one. Mm. We had our first like sold out headline show in, in Cologne in Germany. And uh, we, this is back when we drove our own little mm. tiny van and uh, we loaded in ourselves. We had no crew whatsoever. And uh, we, we did our sound check and then we went around the corner to McDonald's, I think, like a lucky, lucky dinner, kind of. Uh, we had our dinner and then we went back, you know, to prepare for the show that was going to start in an hour or something. And we like we, we got halfway from McDonald's and then there was a line of people, like a really fucking long line, hundreds of meters. And we were like, this can't be this can't be our line, can it? You know, and as we we walked past it, we heard like, you know, and we realized, shit, this is our line. These are our people. They're coming to see our show. And, you know, we walk up and it's sold out and it was like 500 people or something, small club. But I remember just like we started flo floating, really floating, yeah. like high as I've ever been, you know? Yeah. The feeling of, of having that kind of, at the point, success for us. It was the biggest sure. success that far. And it was just, uh, I remember walking off stage and just like, da 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 da, thank you, good night. And then we walked off and we did the, like, the hug, uh, the, the one that really means something where you just, you don't have to speak at all. It's just, I know exactly what you feel right now. Uh, that was a cool, that was yeah. a cool moment. I will never forget that feeling. And then that realization, I'm sure you've had that in, at, in, at some level before the, uh, that moment, but realizing that people can connect with something that you as a group kind of, somebody wrote it in your bedroom, you kind of worked it out and it became a song and now people and get something from it. What made that realization, what did that do to, to the band? It's strange, because I, I don't think I have realized until pretty recently that what we do actually matters and has a place in the world. Mm. I always kind of dismissed our music because uh, of, of like having any real impact on people's lives because we don't write about politics, we don't write about social issues or very serious stuff maybe. Right. We write uh, entertaining music, energetic music. Uh, the, the, the song as a whole is meant to give you a feeling, but the words are like, fuck the words, you know what I mean? <laughs> Most of the time, at least. Uh, and only, uh, you know, people told us along the way, you know, we, we, we are a group of friends that we met because of your music and we didn't know each other and now we have a lot of friends. It's like, wow, it's really cool that, you know, we can connect people. And then recently then people going, you know, we, I needed a break and you cheered me up and, and so on. So that feels amazing, absolutely amazing. And then, like you say, I mean, especially today, a lot of uh, songs are written about politics, but the idea of, of providing us an escape from all of that uh, is, is also, I think, very valuable. Um, so when, when you, and, and that energy you've always had, like you say, the kind of that, that, that positive energy. So was that from, from the outset of the band, was that kind of a, a, a point of emphasis? To kind of, okay, let's, let's not make it too dark and difficult, let's, let's just... I think we sort of grew into that naturally. We never had like we never had a band meeting where we sat down and went and said, "So I think this band should be like a happy band," you know, mm. stuff like that. We kind of grew into it gradually and naturally, and it, it, and it's sort of always been. It's. I don't. I don't really know how to explain it. Is, it, is this maybe more like how you are as people as well? No, that's the that's the weird thing. That is the weird thing. It's what like you asked the first question, kind of. It's the music kind of clicks and the rest. Yeah, it's <laughs> do, really, do, doesn't really... always. It's really weird that okay. this works, but somehow it works. And I think one of the main points, which is a really big emphasis on on this album, is that we always stayed true to what we want to do. Mm. We didn't write our music initially for the fans we or, or the you know the label or the media we wrote music because we wanted to play that's why we started the band and the energy the the high that i got from playing in a room with the, these people and writing songs for, you know for this band that was all i wanted it was never about money or you know chicks or beer you know that that was not the point 
it was really purely about the music. And then, you know, the stuff that followed was like, fine, sure. that's cool and everything. But the focus was always on the music. And on this album, more than ever, I think we're, we've stayed very honest with ourselves and like just say, there are, let there be no boundaries of what we can do. It's not like, you know, if you have a great idea on this side of the fence from rock, you know, or whatever, we can't go there because like, oh, let's go there. And that's always been our thing. And we withstood a lot of pressure from outside, from labels, from managers, from whatnot to, look, you know, sound more like this, sound more like that. And we're like, no, we're going to do this against people's advice sometimes. Uh, maybe, you know, looking back, you should have done differently, but I'm kind of proud of the road we took. And I think this is what kind of unified us as well, that we were on this trip together. And it's, it's a very, it's a fucked up trip. It's very interesting that you mentioned because I might be mistaken because I found this on the internet. But Hannes, did you did you at some point write a paper about kind of uh, what you just mentioned, uh, uh, dealing with pressures and, and, and in the music industry? <laughs> wow! Someone's <laughs> what professor? Someone, someone did I their really homework. Are. I'm impressed. Even I had to think like, did I do that? <laughs> well, yeah, I did. Not about this band. Uh, no, no, but the kind of the, the idea of, of dealing with pressure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I did actually. It's uh, I can't remember what I called. Well, I'm not gonna uh, quiz you on. No, it. please don't, because I can barely <laughs> remember it. But I did. I kind of had to. You know, this was in school, the the Academy of Music that we were talking about earlier, and you kind of had to write about something, and this is what I wrote about. But, I can't really tell you anything about it because it, you I are don't just full of secrets. Like truly, I found <laughs> out like this is the fifth or sixth thing on this promo tour that I'm like, what? You wrote like the other day we were sitting around uh, like just chatting, and he mentions like yeah, Ugly Kid Joe. Like you know, he, I have Ugly Kid Joe's phone number. I was like, what? Yeah, he loves the band. <laughs> what? When? It's like download last year. Oh, well, thanks for introducing me. <laughs> Uh, oh, a professor wrote a paper on the <laughs> pressures of being in a music industry. Me, 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 me. Oh, I can't remember so long ago. I lived in LA for two years. It was kind of, kind of the, the question is um, deciding to, to not make any compromises. And I, I can assume in this music industry, in this musical landscape, that can be quite difficult. So, do you ever feel pressure for. Uh, uh, to keep what you're doing alive, in a sense? Yeah, very much. Okay. Every record, we go through the same phase, more or less. Uh, especially the last two, where I think, like, I think people were right to be concerned and worried that were worked around <laughs> us on the first two records, because we were, I mean, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. <laughs> who, who does when, you know, at that, a, like at that age as a band, having been a band for only a year when we put out the first record and then touring for two and a half years and then putting out the next one so quickly, it's like we, we had to try different things. And with Weekend Man, I feel like we really nailed down like the center of the map kind of. This is where we, this is what we sound like, where we sound more like us than our influences, if you know mm. what I mean. And this, like Club Majesty, is just an expansion of that. Um, yeah. And there's always pressure. Like I said, people have ideas and people want to uh, do this or that. But this has to be fun mm. for us. And, and for this to be fun, we need to keep it about the, the love of music and not about business or like the financial prospects of things. And, uh, and I think most of the pressure comes from ourselves, actually. Yeah. Kind I of mean, a, a standard that you hold yourself. This, to. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, we set the bar pretty high from, from the very get-go. And I mean, this is what we want to do. So we need to make sure that we can keep doing this. And in order to keep doing this, we need to make sure we deliver kick-ass stuff that not only people like, but that we love. Because if we don't, then we're, we're screwed, basically. And people, people are going to see through yeah. it. Because people are not stupid, you know. They're going to put on the album and they're going to be like, okay, they can write songs, they can sing, they can play, but I don't really feel it. There's something missing here. And I think that's one of the, one of the points that made us kind of grow as quickly as we've done, uh, being a guitar-driven, you know, mm. band these days, kind of, is that people spot that honesty and a lot of people said for a long time like it's it's like the four of you are having a party on stage and you get to be like and i always thought it sounded pretty cheesy but it it kind of fits like because it is fun it really mm. is 
uh, and we managed to keep it fun. And uh, I actually think that's the most honest people are ever going to see us. That's okay. that's what we are and how we act and what we do on stage. Because that is so much fun, almost every single night. It truly is. With that in mind, then when you uh, started writing for this record. Is that an anxious period, like you say? Is there a lot of doubt at that yeah, point? Yeah, it's terrible. Or, uh, where, where do you start then? When, when, because, you, like you said, the previous album did well, you kind of found what you wanted out of music. I, f I feel very much like w whenever we make an album, we need that first initial little explosion, okay. uh, you know, to kind of set you off on the journey, like a rocket, mm. you know, like mm. a takeoff. And on, uh, on Weekend Man, it was the song, uh, When I See You Dance With Another. Uh, that was like the start, like, poof, okay, oh, good, now we got momentum, here we go. And this is what the album is going to be this centered is, this around. Is, yeah, exactly. And Fireman and Dancer was the same for this album. Okay. Um, and once that happens, it's kind of just a, a matter of, of tweaking and, and fixing stuff up. It's, the way we make music isn't, we, we don't go into a room and jam, kind of. Okay. We still haven't play, actually played, we're rehearsing the songs right now. So we made the album before we actually played the songs together. Because we re the reasoning being like, standing in a room and playing really loud always feels kick-ass. But you know, that doesn't make the song great. So you can fool yourself into thinking this rocks because you feel all around you. So if we can get that, oh, this is awesome feeling with a small set of speakers and like just the song is really good. Imagine what we're gonna add to it when we put on the rumble, you know what I mean? And also, we record our demos like, we re, I don't even know a, a strong enough word, mm. but we like, we record an album at first, look, before we record an album, right. because we need to know what it sounds like and we need to live with the songs for, you know, a couple of months. Because the second you finish writing a song or making a demo, you always feel kick ass. You know, and a week later, it might not be as kick ass anymore. <laughs> so you need to live with it for a couple of months and that's what we usually do. And it's... Um, we basically record the same album twice. But the second time it's more expensive microphones. <laughs> 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 but, but so after, after taking the time in between them, uh, what did you hear when you put on Fireman and Dancer? Well, what did you... Uh, for, for, for me it was always... Uh, so clear in my mind that this is the stuff that should open the new album. This is the stuff that people should hear first because people will recognize the Royal Republic sound that they are familiar with, uh, but it is like an expanded one. It feels really fresh for us, a place where we are very much at right now. Um, and it sets the mood for the entire album. Yeah. You know, one thing uh, I like about kind of the way you interpret a lot of these songs and disco in, in, in a way. Um, is that you didn't downplay the guitars. So, so was that a conscious effort uh, as well to keep the guitars there but use them in a way uh, that makes sense? I mean, we're, all, we're always going to be a guitar-driven band. Mm. The guitars are always going to be there and there's going to be distortion. It's going to be a rock and roll. But, you know, we, whatever riffs we're writing, I mean, they're going to be played on guitars because those are the instruments that we have at hand. But I mean, we're not we're not shying away from use, using different instruments now. I mean, there are synths on there. There's mm. saxophone on there. Anything that you know, whatever the song or the riff requires, it's gonna be there. And then we'll just have to figure it out once we're about to hit the road and, and go up on stage and perform it live. And that's what we're doing right now, actually. We're There's a lot of to, innovative, uh, like uh, trying innovative to pioneering, stuff. <laughs> like how. Does one do this without a backtrack? For example, Jonas, the, spa the bass player, is no longer a bass pa player. He's actually a guitar player by okay. now. So we'll sort and it out. He's still a bass player. <laughs> and Adam, I believe you decided at some point to learn to play. Well, you mentioned saxophone. You decided to learn to play the saxophone. Yeah. Was that to be able to to kind of I, use it, it on this album? In fact, it was the complete opposite. Okay. It was uh, something to to get away from um, from the muse, like the making music as I know it, kind of. I play a lot of instruments, and I have since I was a kid. And saxophone is, is something that I never, ever touched. And I really enjoy the feeling of being completely new, like not knowing. When, you, when things are still magic, kind of, like everything in life, before you try it and before you learn it, it's just, you know, it's like watching a magic trick and, and you go, oh my God, and then you learn the truth and it's not magic anymore. It's just a, 
blah, it's just a scale. And I kind of feel that way about guitars sometimes, uh, for example. So I just wanted that feeling of trying something new because I figured, like you say, when you buy a new instrument, you know there's at least two songs in there because it's just new and fresh. So the sax was just um, uh, a new thing. Uh, and uh, I put the sax solo on Fireman and Dancer on the demo. Uh, we shipped it off to Germany to our manager and he called back the same day and said, this song really rocks, it's kick, you know, kick ass. And, uh, but? But you cannot put saxophone on the album because nobody on the radio is going to play your songs. People uh, hate saxophone. Yeah, exactly. And that kind of fired us in the completely opposite direction. That's usually the effect it has. Mm. So I started putting saxophone on every demo that we made just to fuck with it in, initially. And then I thought maybe we'll change it later or something. But for me personally, I ended up really enjoying the spice it gave uh, the, land, the sound landscape. Uh, mm. uh, maybe not, it, you know, it's not on every song, mm. but uh, it, it definitely brought some kind of joy and, into the writing for me as well. Um, and I think it, uh, it really belongs where it is. And then do you think you'll play saxophone live as well? Uh, I am not throwing anything off the table at Fair this enough. point. <laughs> So, so you, you have that first song. Are we gonna play saxophone? Question is, <laughs> will there be guitars live? That's more. Like <laughs> <laughs> but you, so you have that first song, kind of the blueprint and the, or the catalyst for for what is the coming? Uh, how quickly after that are these songs written? Is it is it that once kind of the floodgates are open, everything kind of comes naturally? It, it really depends. There is no uh, that. That's what's frustrating about it. There is no given way of doing it except. When you look back at it, it's always the same process. Mm. Like, and that's very satisfactory at this point. That it sucks. It sometimes <laughs> it really sucks making an album. It's tough work because sure. it's such an emotional roller coaster. You feel invincible on one day, and then you feel like the lowest, most talent, useless people ever the next. And it's like that for a couple of months, and you're home, and you're kind of you, you're not getting any input of you know playing. Um, and we argue amongst ourselves, you know, your demo, I don't like it. So, well, I don't like yours. Uh, and then it's like, it's not about the music, it's more like a personal level. Right. Like you said, you don't like mine, so I'm not gonna like yours. Um, and and yeah, but there is a lot of that. And then we have those little moments where, where we all just, yes, this, and I can't, and we can't really define what it is yeah. Like it's the guitar sound or it's mm. the drum sound, it's the tempo, it's the. Yeah, that's weird. It, there there I is mean, some. It, it clicks at the song. Yeah, yeah and so I mean, cool. we do write a lot of songs and we do know how to write songs and write good songs. So, so that's not really the issue. The issue is writing the good songs that sound like Royal Republic and that mm. feel like Royal Republic. And that's got nothing to do with whether it's rock and it's hard and it's, you know. It, it could be anything, like you said. It could be the drum beat. It could be the hook line. It could be that stupid fucking sound. It could be Jonas playing the guitar. Whatever. It, we just know when it sounds and feels like World Republic. But so, so can I assume that that, that you, you maybe have a bunch of songs that are quite good, but that just don't fit you? Oh, we have yeah, so many kick-ass songs. You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, it, it's, but seriously, we have a hook cemetery. Okay. Uh, actually. I know for a fact that we do have one song that if we were to finish it and put it out tomorrow, it'd go boom. We just after. need to finish the verse. <laughs> yeah, we just need to write the fucking song. Chorus goes like this. No. Nope. <laughs> Oops. <coughs> no, but no, no. Does, it, does it become easier then? Over, over, because, uh, well, you've made a couple of albums by now and, and so you kind of know what it entails, what, 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 what you need. But the way you talk about it, it's, it's just you start over every single time. I think we've gotten way. better at, I mean, writing a song is obviously a lot about song structures right. and, you know, here's the verse and then I need a bridge and then I need, need a chorus. We all know the basics of that and we can fiddle around with that. But the question is still whether it's a World Republic sounding song or not. And that's, that's usually what takes a lot of time. Mm. I think it's really easy to get into those kind of, you have your formats kind of. Um, yeah, right. And you don't want to stay too confined to those either. I usually go about it, or like I guess we all do in the end. Just like, don't, never mind the, the structure. Uh, we need to just like, listen second by second, and everybody raise their hand whenever you're bored. You know what I mean? The second you're bored, like, okay, something. So we go one, two, okay, still interesting, still cool. Yep. Seven, yep, all right, let's put, you know, 
let's analyze what went wrong here, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then we'll fix it up and we'll do it again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Stop! All right, there we go. No, let's fix it. And you can and, see why it takes a while. <laughs> Fair enough. And then uh, uh, why, it, why it can be a difficult process, I suppose. Um, but what, what is the feeling then? I, I don't know when you finish the, the album uh, and the writing and kind of. But what is the feeling then once you once you kind of are forced to stop in a way? When you think, okay, now we just should not touch it anymore because otherwise we'll just. Go yeah, next. I mean that goes on forever. At okay. some point, you gotta you gotta stop. I mean, way into releasing and touring albums, mm -hmm. I still think back and you know <laughs> I said, oh, we need to raise the guitars <laughs> on that song. Oh, we should have raised them half a dB uh, on on that part, and you know changes like that. I think that's always going to be the case. You can work things forever. I think Fireman has about a hundred like saved de versions, okay. like of the demo with diff you know different a little riff. Like it goes, that's what it sounds like now. And I have one that goes, and one that goes, you know, like just tiny differences and then different choruses and different shapes, like a different chord there and, you know. Different words as well, obviously. But but so, now, now that the album is finished, do you stick with that one? Uh, because you mentioned kind of you, you're rehearsing and kind of figuring out We're the songs for the live the show. So, so do they do. do they evolve for the live show? Do they change? Uh, if, yeah, I mean, inevitably there will be some changes because we we kind of go with a you know anything goes. Uh, attitude in the studio and whatever helps the song along just you know we're making a record now we're not you know passing an exam on <laughs> how many notes can be played at the same time uh, so we just work it out um, and uh, it's uh, inevitably gonna change we don't have uh, we don't have a marching band of percussionists on the road with us and we don't have a brass section um, uh, we have uh, we have we have talent man that yeah. can take you far Finally, then, um, when did kind of the the the, the concept? Of the, I, I know it's not a concept record, but the, there there is somewhat of a theme go, uh, going through the album. So when when did that um, become apparent to you? When did you realize kind of what direction this album was going to take? Well, first of all, that title, the album title, Club Majesty, has been around for eleven years now. Okay. Can you stop with the fucking counting years and being yeah. an old guy and like? back in the day when we were young and hip <laughs> so for two years now <laughs> two yeah years ago. it's more like it uh, so we had three different options for band names there was royal republic obviously and there was king average which was just <laughs> terrible name. terrible and then there was club majesty and when we started writing this album we, you know fireman and dancer was done and blah 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 and we kind of heard what this album was going to sound like and what kind of vibe we were going for and it was obviously going to be a danceable, disco-ish, you know, a good vibe kind of album. And I think you were just like, at one point you just went like, what about Club Majesty? It still sounds good and it sounds like the album sounds, why don't we just use it? And I don't think we ever, there was no discussion. Okay. It, was, it was there and it was clear. So final question, what, what was the, because you mentioned kind of uh, the live shows, what, what was the last live show you've seen yourself that, that kind of uh, impressed you? Oh, I went to the Royal Albert Hall in London uh, in October last year and I saw John Williams uh, with the London Symphony Orchestra playing like the movie hits. Unfortunately, John Williams was sick uh, the day after he arrived in London, so he in person was not able to conduct the London Symphony Orchestra. So we had a friend, Dirk Brosset, step in and do it, but it was an insanely magical evening, and you will never hear that music being performed any better than by that orchestra. That was an unforgettable experience for me. Mine was uh, Lee Ronaldo in Malmö, actually. Okay. Our hometown, my hometown, a guitar player from Sonic Youth. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, mind-blowing. It was just fantastic. I mean, he, he came up on stage just dragging the guitar behind him like this. And usually you would go like, oh, that's such a pretentious fucking douchebag. Mm. That's nothing. Anyone can do that. It's like a painter going like this. 
and you go, anyone can do that. But I realized this at this particular evening and at that particular time when he came in with the guitar, dragging it behind him and it sounded like fucking heaven to me. I realized, no, not everyone can do this. This is actually well, well thought through and he knows exactly what he was doing. And he kept going like that. I mean, he hung the guitar from the ceiling and made it go like, and every time it passed you, it went like, it was unbelievably cool. All right. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank Pleasure. You. Thank you.